episode of the Put On Raiders podcast. I'm your host, Dwayne Douglas, podcasting with Ryan Holmes off the beautiful shores of the Pacific Ocean. Beautiful day out here in Southern California. Um, our, our TPOW podcast is my Twitter handle, R-H-O-L-M-22, is for Ryan. Um, uh, you got Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter, all that good stuff. You can see us there. Um, thanks for listening to the show in North, North Carolina. Um, Washington, D.C., Miami, Florida, Seattle, Washington, and um, Paris, Texas. Our telephone text line number is 858-299-5592. Had to change it. Um, so if you had the other one, there's a new one. So don't worry about it. Ryan, how are you doing today? Doing yeah, good. Good. So we got a lot, we got a lot of Raider news to talk about today. Um, and the Raiders are out here, um, you know, in training camp, all those things like that. Uh, we do have a guest um, on our program today, and he is Bobby Peters. He had a little, you know, little time in his hands. They got, they got a really a real quality um, um, book out here for for the for the Raiders, um, and talking about John Gruden's offense and kind of things that you know we as fans, you know, love to love to hear about. Um, Bob, Bobby, how you doing today? Pretty good. How you doing? Good. Um, can you talk about like this whole like this? This is like a, a labor of like love of of, of 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 some sort because I mean you you have to love going deep into this to to sit here and do this. It's almost like you kind of have to maybe got a log cabin and just with some tape and just sit there and watch watch all this tape and get all that stuff done. Um, what? How does? How did that? You know, start where you just kind of said, "Hey, I'm gonna go." and do these books where, you know, where these manuals of these offensive teams is kind of so people can learn the concepts and everything like that. Sure. Yeah. I think a labor of love is the perfect way to describe it. Um, I, you know, ever since I was a young kid, you know, back in the, the old VHS days, I would record games on VHS and, you know, replay them in my parents' basement. And, you know, I'd have notebooks filled with, you know, drawing up concepts and stuff. And, you know, as I, as I, you know, as my playing career winded out and I got into coaching, you know, obviously, you know, NFL game pass came out and, mm-hmm. you know, all that stuff in YouTube and all that stuff was a lot more accessible digitally. So you could go back and rewatch it and all that stuff. And, you know, I was, I was charting stuff pretty intensely and, and somebody gave me the idea one time, Hey, you know, this would, you know, this would be a, a lot of coaches would be interested in this if, you know, you put it together into a, a book format. So probably, you know, four, maybe four or five years ago, I started doing that. And each year, I, I like to think that the quality gets a little bit better. I think, you yeah. know, maybe two years ago, I switched to using uh, Just Play Sports Solutions as my uh, my diagram base. And I think that that kind of jump started um, uh, a little bit of the, the quality with the diagrams there as well. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, going back to your original point, calling it a labor of love is definitely true. I love doing it. It's a lot of fun. And you know, it's, it's nice that, you know, at the end of the day, it's a nice finished product and it's something that, you know, coaches and fans can, can enjoy. Yeah, sure. A, a, a lot of folks are just, I'm um, talking about it a lot. Even a couple of my friends who are not Raider fans, they went on Amazon and got it and they, and they love it and they, and they love it. So it's really cool to kind of see um, what, what goes on there. So 2020, um, the Raiders offense moved the football um, you know, down the stretch, didn't do a great job in the red zone, but like, you know, they did score, you know, the 10th most, they averaged the 10th most points in the, in the league last year. Third down was pretty much a, a, good, a good down for them. Um, it almost seems like some games they wanted to get on third down so they could, so they can look for a big play. Um, what are your, when you were charting that stuff, what was the, you know, biggest thing that, you know, kind of stuck out to you on third down and why were they so successful? Yeah, it definitely stuck out to me. Um, they So on third downs, one of their biggest concepts that they use is a concept that many NFL teams call the choice concept. And what it is is um, out of a usually like a two-man tight bunch, um, the, the, one of the guys who's typically on the ball, will he'll run like a vertical or a corner out. And the other receiver who's off the ball um, most likely would you know be Darren Waller or Hunter run for almost all the time. Um, either one of those two would be the off-ball receiver, and they would run what's called a choice route. So they would kind of get in the jet stream of that first receiver to kind of, you know, create a free release for him. And he'd essentially have a, like a a three-way go at about five yards. He could either break out, break in, or against like a soft zone, settle down and just sit right, sit down right there in the, uh, the the other receiver's jet stream. And that, that's something that the Raiders coaching staff, as well as Waller and Renfro, um, you know, obviously they, they coached it very well. Their technique was great on it. 
if either one of those guys was one-on-one in those situations, they were winning it almost every time. And Derek Carr threw the ball on time and accurately um, a ton. I want to say offhand, I think they called it um, like 21 or 22 times on third down situations and converted over 50% just with that one particular concept. Um, and they, the Raiders did a really good job protecting that concept too. They had um, a concept I call smash return, which is basically, it's the exact same, it's the exact same look out of like a two man bunch except the off ball receiver will break out and then kind of whip back inside. So it's kind of like a double move. And, and Hunter Renfro was, um, he, he was the main guy for that. They didn't let Wall, Waller didn't run that a ton. It was mostly Renfro, but um, that was another high percentage conversion. I think that one was in the 60% range if I, if I'm uh, remembering correctly, but um, yeah, no, they were definitely very good on third down. And a lot of that has to do, I think big picture, a lot of it has to do with um, the way they coach those concepts, the player's ability to take the coaching on that and, 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 to, and to win those one-on-one matches in those situations. And then also Derek Carr having a strong understanding of the concept. And hey, if, if my, my choice routes one-on-one, those guys are going to win. And most, a lot of times they did. Yeah. Um, do you think also the offense was a little too much of, of Waller and Renfro. I mean, like reading, reading, reading the back of the, reading the book and seeing that, like, I mean, Waller has obviously been a fine for them. I mean, that was just, I mean, Greg Olson finding him off the practice squad should almost make him a lifelong coach on, on the team, on the roster, finding somebody that talented. I mean, just, I mean, and Baltimore's a good team. So it's kind of crazy that Baltimore didn't get, get a little bit more out of them, but was it too much of that? Was it just like kind of the lack of, faith in the young receiving core. I know, I know that Algalar has some big plays in this offense as well, too. Yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, you know, as you know, cause I, I coach high school ball as well. And I, I look at the Raiders and I, I almost think the opposite. And I think, wow, they did a great job getting their two best receivers. The yeah. ball. You want, you want to feature those guys as much as possible. Now, it depends on the defense too, right? Like if, yeah. you know, a team like Kansas city, you know, I think one of the, the big touchdown to rugs, they wanted to double team Waller on a choice route. And that, that opened up rugs for a big, there's like a 70 or 75 yard yeah. touchdown. And in those cases, yeah, you want to look to other guys, but if, if, if those guys are one-on-one and they're winning one-on-one, you just got to keep feeding the beast. But yeah, um, I think that's kind of, that's something that, you know, depending on what, how defenses respond and react, you know, I think that'll, that kind of dictates a lot more who gets touches and stuff um, in that case. And that's kind of my, not to, not to go off on a tangent, but that's kind of one of my pet peeves with fantasy football too, is, yeah. you know, a defensive game plan, you know, can completely take away a number one receiver, you know, for fantasy football uh, purposes, you know, and Waller could have two catches one week, but then have 15 the next, you know, it yeah. just, it depends how defenses want to adjust and um, game plan the Raiders. You also talked about the um, vertical um, blocking in their, in their scheme is that was like that, that was one of the things that they struggled with last it was last year was trying to just run the guy I know they know he wants to run the football um you know Gruden wants to run the football everywhere he's gone he wants to run the football um that was like a problem for this um offensive line they, they couldn't get that vertical push at times yeah so so yeah I talk about in the book a lot um just the vertical run game and what I mean by that is most NFL teams are outside zone base so what they're trying to do is get the ball on the edge the running back will press the edge and look for cutbacks the, the Raiders were one of the first teams I studied that based out of inside zone. So what they're trying to do, instead of trying to get to the edge, they're trying to go inside and they're trying to get more of a vertical push. The double teams are trying to, trying to knock back the defensive linemen. And in that case, um, you know, obviously the cutbacks are still there. You know, it's still a big part of the offense. Actually, I think I posted a clip to Twitter uh, last night of a cutback off inside zone, but they, um, it's even with the, the ability to get the cutbacks, if you're not getting that vertical push or if a nose guard is, is kind of eating up a double team and mm-hmm. the linebackers can flow downhill hard, it's hard to get the, those plays going. But there were, there were a few aspects of, of those concepts that the Raiders did well, but um, you obviously that, you know, you want to, you want to see improvement on that uh, going into this season. And we are talking to Bobby Peters. He is the author of the 2020 Las Vegas Raiders complete offensive Manual, um, really good book. Um, does a great job with it. Ryan, uh, what you got for him? Well, for those of you on YouTube, here's what, here's what the book looks like. Uh, you can't really see it because um, I have a background up. But um, yeah, you can order it off Amazon. My my question to you, Bobby, I, you just talked a little bit about the inside zone. Do you, I don't know how much you follow the team, but do you think that had to do more with injuries on the on the offensive line versus the skill set? And it sounds like this year that they want to go more outside zone. Uh, definitely with the drafting of Leatherwood and, and the move to uh, James and hopefully uh, bringing incognito back off the injured list. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say I'm, a, you know, I'm definitely not an expert on the Raiders offensive line personnel, so I can't, I can't speak a ton to that. But I mean, it's, it just seemed like they had more of those, like those bigger type guys who could get vertical in the run game. So I think that's, that's something that they, um, yeah, you know, it's just they were better at inside zone than outside zone. So I think that's kind of what, what they ended up leaning on more. Um, you know, in the outside, some of the outside zone concepts they ran, I, I it was hard, you know, it was hard for me to kind of put my thumb on, you know, what they were, um, you know, what part of that was, was successful for them or, or what, you know, what they struggled with necessarily to make them more of an inside zone team, but there were certain versions. And I think part of it too is, is Josh Jacobs as a running back. I think his vision on inside zone is tremendous. There were some of those cut, I think week 10 against Denver, he had some really good cutbacks on inside zone where he's bouncing the ball back um, all the way backside. And I, and some of the two is the way the Raiders schemed up inside zone. Um, what they would do is whether it be out of 21 personnel or, or 12 personnel is they would run it to, they would run it out of what I call like nub or slot formations. So the tight end, an inline tight end would be by himself on one side of the field. And then the rest of the receivers would be to the other side. And, you know, whether there's a fullback or not, you know, they, they did it either way. And then they would run inside zone away from the tight end. Well, you know, typically if that tight end's Darren Waller, a defense has to leave a corner backside, right? Like you don't want to leave a linebacker matched up with Waller because then Gruden's going to split him out and, you know, run one-on-one -on -one ISO routes to him. So typically what, what that does now on the run game and what it does for Josh Jacobs is when Josh Jacobs cuts the ball back, the unblocked defender is going to be a corner by himself back there and a corner trying to tackle a downhill. Josh Jacobs is not a good recipe uh, for de for defenses. So I think that's part of, part of the, you know, I, I think that's kind of another way they married the personnel with the scheme in that sense and why inside zone ended up being a lot better for them. Cause a lot of their big plays came on, you know, yeah, they got some vertical push, but then Josh Jacobs would bounce that ball back. The, the offensive line would account for all the box defenders and then, you know, in a single high defense, that corner is typically unblocked and Josh Jacobs would either make a miss, run him over, or, you know, he would, the corner would make the tackle 12 yards downfield. So um, I think it's just a marriage of scheme and personnel as to why um, that, that concept kind of ended up being their, their bread and butter run scheme. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, watching as much film as I do, I, I really appreciated having this book. It, I, I read the whole thing in one day. I wish NFL Game Pass was working so I could actually go in because you do give examples of different plays in different games of where these concepts show up. So once that's working, I'm going to jump back in and read the book again. But um, you mentioned a lot how Gruden puts defense in conflict. And one interesting concept you talked about um, was the run base option the quarterback would have at the line of scrimmage. As someone who watches film like myself, like how do you determine – um, if you think there's two, two plays tag one versus single high one versus two high, whether it's inside zone and Z curl or whatever, is it seeing the formation over and over again? Um, or how do you get to those determinations? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And that's kind of, um, that's kind of the next level stuff when it comes to doing these breakdowns or like watching NFL tape is trying to piece a lot of that together. And, you know, I mean, obviously I could be wrong on some of it. Um, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and claim that I know for a fact, cause you know, I'm not in those coaches meetings, so I don't know, but you know, I, I think a lot of that Ryan is based on formations. Um, you know, like I was talking about there, like say, say the offense is lined up in that, you know, that I slot formation I was talking about. So they're in an I formation with uh, the tight end by himself to one side and two receivers to the other side. Um, you know, a couple of their favorite concepts out of that were, was that inside zone lead week that we were just talking about. And then the Z curl concept that you mentioned. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, when you see, you know, with those two being their favorite concepts in those situations, um, or in, in that form, those in, in that formation, excuse me. Um, you know, when they get to the line and you see car checking, you're like, okay, one high, he's doing this two highs. Like you can, you can, you can try to see if there's any patterns forming. And that's, that's really what it comes down to is if you can see a pattern forming, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to call it out my book and say, Hey, I saw, you know, this is what I think it is. You know, I'm not claiming that I know for a fact. So, um, you know, I, you, you know, if, if anybody, you know, if anybody's talking to Gruden or if anybody, you know, asks him at a press conference, you know, I, I don't know if he would answer that, you know, it's a pretty technical <laughs> question or a pretty, you know, game plan specific question, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's, yeah, to me, that's, that's the next level stuff with those books that, you know, on the surface, it's hard to, you know, piece together, but when you, you know, when you cut up all the concepts or when you cut up every clip and then you can kind of watch like, okay, I've got, you know, 15 Z curl concepts here out of this formation. And then I've got, you know, 10 inside zone lead weeks out of this formation. Okay. You can kind of see patterns start to form in that, in that case, but from game to game, it's obviously very difficult, you know, unless, 
Um, you know, you obviously know the play calls, but I think something interesting too now, you know, going into 2021, you know, that's something with these books. And obviously, you know, you guys can do it as well as when I watch a Raiders game this fall, I'm going to, I'm going to be watching. Okay. When they're in that I slot formation. All right. You know, and I see car checking at the line and I see the defense. Can I be Tony Romo here and say, all right, they're running inside zone lead week, you know, Jacob's off the left side, or are they going to be throwing the curl route to rugs here? You know what I mean? Like, I think that's the kind of stuff that, you know, makes, makes that part of it. Um, you know, trying to take that to the next, that analysis to the next level. Yeah, I think the one thing I'm going to take from this book is looking at down and distance personnel formations and then trying to guess off my TV before the snap. Like, hey, this is what they run a lot in this. Are they going to mix it up? Are they going to run this concept, that concept? And um, no, it was good, you know, just going through the book and, and seeing all that. The one thing I kept going back to was choice versus looky. And you kind of explained it in the book. I still don't really know the difference because it seems like looky is always the tight end. It's just Waller, it's, it's shorter, it's quicker. But can you talk about choice versus looky and kind of how they run that, who they run it to? Yeah, no, Ryan, that's a great question. <laughs> Again, man, I mean, you're, you're firing off these questions. You got some good questions tonight, man. Um, <laughs> but, so, okay, so choice and looky. For the longest time, even in the data, I would tag them as the same concept because they're it's they're very similar. Um, and the Raiders and the Raiders, and this is another use of personnel um, that they did well too, is they didn't they didn't run choice or looky with really many other receivers other than Waller or Renfro. I think there was maybe one clip that ended up being an interception in Week 15 against the Chargers, um, where Mariota threw a pick. I can't remember which receiver they were trying to fit the the choice route into in that case, but Zay Jones. I mean, yep. Yeah. So that so that's an example of you know. You know, we, I know we talked about earlier, okay, are they looking at Renfro and Waller too much? Well, well, no, because they're, they're the two guys that run that route really well. And if they're one-on-one, -on -one, they should be open. Mm -hmm. um, but, but in the, so the, the, the difference with the looky is, well, I guess the choice route you two, you want to break inside, but looky is more just out of a spread formation, a two by two. Um, well, not, two, not a two by two necessarily, because they could do it on empty, but you know, a two man surface where the receivers are spread out and it's really just, you know, Waller against, uh, you know, a defender with, and you might not get a free release, but yeah, they, I, I'm trying to remember if they ever ran that. Well, no, they did. They did with Renfro a little bit in their three by one sets, but whenever it was to a two man side and Waller was the number two receiver flexed out, it was almost always looking to him. Yeah. I just remember looking at that, that famous Chris Sims play where he's trying to repeat it over and over again with Gruden and Tampa. And he yep. just keeps saying, look, he's like in that call. So, um, the one thing that I, you know, charting, I, I don't chart per se, but I do break down every game, every play and kind of post some stuff on, on YouTube. The Yankee concept I saw a lot of last year didn't really come up in the book, but did you see them running a lot of, of, of the Yankee concept, usually on early downs, first, second down, you know, those two man concept shot plays down the field off of play action? Yep. So I group that. Um, I, I have that, that, that there is a section for that in the book. It's uh, like, it's, it's under, I believe cross or PA cross, like play action okay. cross. So there is a section for it in the book um, and they run it a bunch of different ways. Um, and I, I kind of go, I think, you know, and every team runs a different flavor of it. Um, I think the Packers, you know, I, I, cause I wrote a book breaking down the 2020 Packers as well. And they, they, they kind of tried to feature it in a different way, but with the Raiders, what they wanted to do was most of the time is they tagged. So, Obviously, you know, when you talk about Yankee or cross, one of the receivers is running a high crossing route. He's trying to get across the field at about 20 yards. And the receiver on the other side will typically either run a corner, a post, or some sort of vertical clear out. And a lot of the nuance with the play is what that other route is. And the Raiders, a lot of the times, um, had that guy run what's called a cop route. So it's like a corner post. So what they were trying to do is, and that that's another concept that, that, that I believe they were grouped into their one high, two high checks because – um, that cross concept isn't very good against two high coverages because safeties can rob it and cut the crosser, but against single high, it's a lot more difficult. So I believe in single high is specifically why they wanted to run that cop route was if the free safety wanted to cut it. Now you've got, you know, rugs, who's a burner going right down the middle of the field on a corner post with a corner playing outside leverage on him. So I thought that was an interesting way to, you know, it's like, okay, we can run this concept and we know it's good against single high and we can protect it with a cop route. Um, for the front side receiver as the alert for car coming off the play action. And if we get too high, we don't like it, you know, after a motion or a shift and we see it's too high after the defense rotates, we'll just hand the ball off, you know, on an early down, like you said, first or second down. So that's kind of how the Raiders uh, featured it in their system. Definitely. That's kind of what I saw a lot too, is it's those two, two man vertical shots, usually early, early down and distance trying, trying to get a big play um, alert routes too, and, and they used, Henry Ruggs a lot on alert routes, kind of just, you know, it's a pre-snap read. If it's not there, you know, cars going somewhere else. Um, I, I saw that a lot. Another thing in the book that I liked was 
you know, it's kind of breaking the field down. They're half field reads for Derek Carr. Like he's going to have one concept at on one side, one on the other, then based on the defense, um, kind of know where he's going. Um, and I was playing Madden today and I was kind of doing that. I'm like, all right, I got, you know, I got a corner out from Waller. I got <laughs> Kenyon Drake out of the backfield based on the alignment. There's some stuff I read in your book. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this. And it, and it works. So it's kind of cool, you know, taking those concepts and, and using them in a video game format, but certain things to look for. But, but do you think that, with the net, what's the next evolution in, in the red zone for Raider fans? Because we're going to want to know the low red zone inside the 10, you're calling plays. What do you think the strengths of this team are? And what, how do you think they can be more productive? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, and that's definitely kind of that next level analysis. Um, and another point of that next level analysis. And then honestly, I didn't really touch on it a ton in the book. But I think, you know, with inside zone being your bread and butter run scheme, that's a good red zone run scheme as well. Um, I, I think that's something that they can lean more into, into the red zone. I don't know. I'd have to go back to, to the book and look at the exact numbers and how they inside zone fared in the red zone, or if they called specific versions that just didn't, you know, make sense or, or, or how that worked. But um, I think kind of leaning more into that, those, you know, your bread and butter run schemes is always something that, that can help you. And then the other part of it too, is having, having strong, um, you know, game plan specific red zone concepts as well, because you can't really take your base pass concepts or your base play action stuff. Um, and, and, you know, the field's just a lot smaller down there, especially inside the 10, you can't, you know, you gotta have, you gotta have specific stuff in mind there. And I think, um, you know, the, the famous Gruden, you know, spite of two Y banana, I think that's a, that's another classic staple red zone concept too. They, they could, you know, obviously lean into more calls that a lot and, and they do dress it up different ways with different formations but it, it's essentially the same play um and then four verticals you mentioned that's kind of one of their favorite concepts it, it's one of the, my favorite concepts as well um can you talk about how they run it and and why they're so successful at it yeah um so the four vertical concept was a really interesting piece for me for this book because i'm not a huge just true four verticals fan i think it's a concept that's you know unless you coach it right and unless you're really strong with the details you you know, it's just, you're just sending guys deep and it's like backyard football, but very well. And Derek Carr had a very strong understanding of the concept. He, you know, if, if the, um, you know, the receivers were covered or the matchups didn't end up playing out how he liked, he would, he would get to the top of his drop, hitch up real quick and get the ball to the check down a ton. And in that case, and this is something that was very unique to the Raiders, you know, as opposed to a lot of other NFL teams I studied, um, most other NFL teams will just call that concept on third and longs, you know, okay, it's just a hope and a prayer type concept. Well, the Raiders called it a lot on early downs, first and second down. And for them, it was an all purpose concept. It still had that big play potential, right? Where you got four guys deep and, you know, evenly spacing the field against, you know, and, and trying to create one on one matchups against single high coverage. But at the same time, if the defense covers it up, you know, Carr was hitting that check down, picking up five yards. Now you're in second and five. And that's, you know, as a coach, if you're, if you trust your quarterback in those situations, you can call that play, you know, three or four times a game on early downs and you'll, you'll be in good shape. And quite honestly, even against two high coverages, um, you know, if the receivers are getting double teamed, you know, whether the Raiders were checking out of it, you know, check, you know, like we talked about earlier, they could check into a run in those looks, or they could, um, you know, they could just trust Carr to hit the check down. Cause in that case, you know, the, the, the defense is getting three over two on, on both verticals on each side. So that's leaving the running back one-on-one -on, -one on a middle linebacker. You know, typically on an underneath option route um, coming out of the backfield on the check down. So that's something that, you know, even if it's too high, the concept works because you can get your running back one-on-one -on -one in space. Oh, definitely. They'll run it out of every formation or personnel grouping too. You'll see it in 13 personnel, 12 personnel, 22 personnel. They'll do switch releases and, and all kinds of different things, but um, just really enjoyed the book and the breakdown. It, I'm sure it's a better read with NFL game pass working. Um, but it, like, I just wanted to, to thank you for putting it out there as a Raider fan who watches a lot of film. It was, it was very intriguing to, to dive into this and I couldn't put the book down. Literally, I read the whole thing literally in one day. That's awesome, man. I appreciate those kind words. It means a lot. <laughs> yeah, man. It, it was, it was great Point. reading. It was great reading. Um, able to kind of, kind of, kind of dive into that, um, that, that playbook, that Gruden, Gruden's playbook, Gruden's mind, if you will. It was kind of good to see. Um, Bob, Bobby, thank you for coming on um, the show, man. We appreciate it and um, good luck in the future. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on, guys. All right. I want to thank um, Bobby Peters um, for his just insight and, you know, just really just going through all these 
some concepts the Raiders have. I think some of the things that he said makes me feel like, I mean, like, I, I think when he come, when, when Gruden came back, we had questions and all this stuff like that, but it just, now that he's getting more and more pieces to the puzzle, they, he is running a high level offensive situation here with the, with the Vegas, with the Vegas Raiders. It's not some um, outdated, like, you know, Mickey Mouse outfit. It's not the bed and breakfast offense of 2006. Bed and breakfast. <laughs> Please, please. Was that was that white? Was that was who's that? Who's who's the Tom Walsh special? Tom Walsh, yeah, Tom Walsh. That was Tom yeah. Walsh and Art Shell. Shell. I love it. I love it. Great offense. Great offense. But like, if you're a coach and you lost to one of those, I mean, they won like three games that year, right? Or two games? Was it two and fourteen? I think it was two and fourteen. Uh, but like, yeah, two. That was the year that Randy Moss basically quit. Yeah, I know. Geez. I mean, like, I I can't lie about that one. If, if I if I had that, if I had Walsh as my, like, he he basically he had the wrong Walsh calling plays for him out there um more more yeah. raider more raider news today kj Wright in the building he left the building with no deal um i thought we had thought that they um you know a, a friend of the show phil jones thought he thought he did have a deal didn't have a deal um but you know he definitely i mean listen i like the raiders linebackers as is right now and i like I'll, but i also like competition so if you're going to bring in KJ Wright, why not? He knows that system inside and out. Um, you know, he was, he's an NFL starter. Um, you know, the Raiders have not had NFL starters at linebacker many years. They have, I, th- I think they have three, I think they have three guys right now who are NFL starters. Um, you bring him in, maybe he can, maybe he can accelerate this whole program. Um, I guess it's two of the teams who are looking for his services, but, but Ryan, um, he would fit um, the silver and black pretty well. Yeah, the, the big thing with the Raiders, and they do have some speed and athleticism at linebacker, but in Gus Bradley's defense, that Sam linebacker plays on the inline of scrimmage in the front, and he has to be able to set the edge. I, I, I question whether the Raiders can do that. Um, clearly, I don't believe Littleton's big enough to do that. And then so now you're, if you're going to play Morrow inside, Kwiatkowski's not going to play outside. So now you're, you're limiting what you have to set the edge as a Sam linebacker. They don't really have that. If Tanner Muse can't do it, um, and I don't, I would guess at this point he can't because he's converting from college safety. He's not big enough to handle um, tackles and tight ends on the strong side of the formation. Uh, then they don't have that linebacker on, on their team and they want to play a lot of four, three base. So I, I do hope that they do revisit this and KJ Wright left the building, but there are reports that he's just mulling over offers. Um, the reason he's still available is from everything I've, I've seen online is two he year. wants a two year deal and teams are only offering one. Give him two years. Um, but he can step right. Yeah, he can step right in and start. Um, if they do go to nickel, then they have three pieces that are really good. I like Kwiatkowski as depth, although it'd be yeah. for one year because you're not going to carry him uh, the third year of that contract if he if he's not a starter. But um, the more depth, the better. But they they do need a Sam linebacker in this defense, so yeah. he would be a really good fit if he does decide to come over. Yeah. So so hopefully that gets done. Um, do you see them? I mean, are like, are you really? I understand that we have that, that the Raiders have Hobbs. They like Hobbs. I know. I understand that the Raiders, um, you know, that Mika Robinson, all this, all, all this stuff like that. But they they're looking for a slot. Nevin Lawson is not the guy right now. What do you do? Do you really put that kind of pressure? Well, game one putting a rookie out there at you, you're probably already starting a rookie at free safety. Um, are you going to put a rookie at, uh, at, at, at slot corner and Hobbs, the, the kid out of Illinois, or do or what do what do you do in that situation to kind of battle that? Me personally, I, I don't think they will. Mm-hmm. Um, the issue they're going to face here is Nevin Lawson suspended for the first two weeks. So even if he's the starting slot, he's not available to you Yeah. Uh, against Baltimore, who's going to give you heavy two tight end run for formations and Hobbs won't be on the field there a lot but then you go you go up and play Pittsburgh and they're going to spread it out and they're going to throw it around with Ben and he's going to pick on him all day Hobbs to me is physically has good traits where he could be a player in this league but I don't think he's anywhere near ready um, to go out there and play you know 30 40 snaps a game in that defense right now I just I just don't see it so I, I think they're a slot corner short if they do bring in KJ Wright that they could stay in their base four three if they're just going to be playing a lot of zone variations Mm -hmm. um early because i don't think they're going to be challenged much vertically um those first two or three games you throw miami in as well 
Um, but moving on against Kansas City, they're gonna they would you can't stay in a four or three base defense against Kansas City when they're yeah. running three by one sets and, and they're an eleven personnel. No. Um, so this team needs a slot corner, and if Nevin Lawson is that guy, I do have serious concerns there because uh, I think me and you have the same number of career interceptions as Nevin Lawson does um, in his seven or eight year NFL career. That that's a concern. Um, he's been okay. He, he hasn't been terrible, but he, he doesn't make plays so i mean he's reliable for the defense they like his toughness but it's not looking good uh, i don't think our net's going to slide inside either and, and to me amig robertson he has a chance right now but you're not really hearing anything out of tra- training camp that, that he's making a push for for a job there either yeah so that's going to be a tough situation um roby coleman's still out there isn't he i mean they're not going to add anybody though um uh, i think he's signed um, he signed he would be a good pickup if they could mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. Um, let's look him up real quick. Yeah. All right here. Trojan. Fight on Trojan. Trojan. Fight on. Got to fight on <laughs> every day. But um, I mean, unless I mean, you got to. I mean, you can't. It's I. I understand. He. He. To me, he's a better player than than Nevin Lawson anyway. But like at the end of the day, like I mean, you. I mean, Nevin Lawson put. He's a free agent. Still a free agent. So yeah, I mean, that's really something that I would um. That I would definitely. I would definitely roll with. I'd roll. I roll with that. I mean, roll with that out in the future because you can't just give away. Give away, give away yards, give away yards, give away points in those situations because he, because because you can't cover the slot and you know um was it what's the what's the kid Dante Johnson whatever his name is in Pittsburgh and throw him in the slot against or, or Juju Smith Schuster in a slot I mean in game two that's going to be a tough one to um, to deal with um we talked about the running backs and you know Theo Theo Riddick is <laughs> is, is has choosing to retire from the from the game of football. And then, in, you know, so I left the, the Sam Young to retire from the game of football. And now um, Jalen Rashard gets hurt with a foot injury out indefinitely. We're seeing some of those, a lot of these now, like little foot injuries that are going to be out for out indefinitely. What does that do to the Raiders? Is that, um, you know, that, that, that kind of that, that kind of puts a little damper on, on that um, running back room, a little stress there as far as that. You do have Drake, you do have Josh Jacobs, but you do need – a third back, right? Yeah, I, I think they do need a third down back. And, and reports are that it says indefinitely, and I've seen two, three weeks. So probably you're looking at three to four weeks. So he's probably not going to be ready until hopefully opening day. Um, Drake's going to play some special teams. I anticipate he's going to be the kick returner. So he's going to have some other responsibilities as well. And I think they're planning on using him more in the slot and out wide as a receiver more than they're going to use him as a pure third down back. So, um, and I don't think Jacobs they're going to use as a ton on third downs either. So, uh, and I, I tweeted out a couple of days ago when Theo Reddick went out there, there are some third down backs out there that can go get. And uh, I'd like to see Duke Johnson on this team, yeah. uh, a guy that can go get you 40 catches out of the backfield. And he's, he's pretty good at running routes out of the slot as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I know there was some interest in Chris, Chris Thompson a couple of years ago. He played under Jay Gruden in Jacksonville yeah. and played in Washington. He, he got hurt last year. But another guy that um, that has played well as a receiving back out of the backfield. But they don't really have another guy on the roster that can do that. And you can always use Ingold uh, as a, le- as a big, bigger back if you need to. Um, but if something happened to Jake – or I'm sorry, Jacobs, Drake could be – running back one but you still then you don't really have a third down back he's not going to play 100 percent of the snap so uh, i anticipate they will bring in a another third down back here in the next you know three or four days probably to get a look at as we as we move through camp and then you need them obviously in the games because i don't expect drake or jacobs to play in a preseason game no um, definitely so we did have uh, i did did, i did throw a a poll a poll out there today to our to our um to the raider fans and it was if kj wright joins the raiders who will be the odd man out? I, I forgot to put. I want to put. I want to put kind of put snap counts out there. Um, in, in, in essence, but um, 55%. I put Tanner. I put Tanner Muse just laughing. But um, Tanner Muse, <laughs> 55%. Um, and Littleton got 24%. Um, as far as losing snaps to KJ Wright, if if if, 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 if he does join, you can kind of tell who the Raider fans like with this because Moro had like four percent. <laughs> and Morrow, they, they, the people love Nicholas Morrow, and I like him too. But like, it's it's funny how like you can see that immediately as far as far as um as far as that goes. Um, 
one last thing before we go. I mean, one last thing for each before we go to, before we go from the go to the NFL show. Um, the Raiders should one hundred percent not even look at trading uh, Marcus Mario <laughs> for to the Colts. Could you imagine the carnage if they actually finish a game ahead of the Raiders for the wild card? And it's because of Marcus Mariota. Like, let them flounder. That was that they they, they wanted to part of that Carson Wentz um, pie and let them deal with it now. Like, you know, I mean, it, it, I would not have, I would not touch that deal. I mean, I would trade him to the Bears or an NFC team, maybe, but like, there's no way. There's absolutely no way I would um I would do that at all. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. No, I, I would need at least a second round pick, which they don't have. They use that on the Carson Wentz trade. I'm not trading him to the Colts for a third. I, I may trade him to the NFC for a third, but um, the Raiders did everything they could to keep him on the roster to get yeah. him to take that that salary cut. Um, they did need him last year for a game. Derek Carr's been very durable uh, outside of a couple of injuries, but um, I don't think Gruden's willing to, to to move Mariota right now, knowing that if something happened to Derek Carr, this is still a pretty good roster he's put together, and they could still win with Marcus Mariota. So I, I don't think he's going to be helping out the Colts. No, I don't think so either. I don't think I think we'd never do that as well. Anything? Any other notes from the Raiders? I mean, we t- talked to Bobby for a long time. We got a lot of concept stuff, and then a lot of um, you know offensive game planning and things like that. Um, anything else about the Raiders you want to talk? Oh, we did. Oh, we did do the. That we had a little fun. It was like I was like, "Hey, like with this current team, which 2016 Raider, not named Khalil Mack, because that was that's the last year the Raiders were really top flight, um, 2016. Who would you bring back to this roster if you could go in the DeLorean with Michael J. Fox and and bring that guy back? Who 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 would that guy be for you? For me, it'd be Amari Cooper. I know Raider fans probably don't want to hear that, but to have another dynamic guy on the outside that can run routes and that can win. Um, if you had him on this team with Waller and Ruggs, or even and Edwards. if it wasn't Ruggs, if it was Edwards yeah. uh, and Renfro, um, I'd like to see that. Uh, it was tough when I went through the defensive names on that roster, and I'm like, yeah, I don't want any of these guys. Um, so I had to focus on the offense, but then Amari Cooper it kind of stuck out to me. For me, it had to be it had to be Cooper as well. I think the only other person I would think about would be the, would be the, well, my one of my favorite was was the Nico Autry of all those teams. Um, you know, just just like you know, it definitely add some depth to that defensive line. But it had, I mean, Cooper would be. I mean, this off. I mean, this this thirty points a game, easy. I mean, this is this is thirty. I mean, this is this is way yeah. with the, they're they're going to be a top five offense if they had Mario Cooper on this team. I mean, you couldn't. I mean, the, with the, when hearing. Bobby talk about the concepts and talk about how much, how, how, you know, how, what a high level of, you know, you know, thinking goes behind everything in this, in this offensive unit. I mean, to have somebody like that, I mean, it, it seems like that's, that's the missing piece is the top flight wide out. Like they have Waller, they have a third down guy in, um, in Renfro, um, you know, they have a lot of the pieces they can run and hopefully they can run the football better. But it just seems like that would be the missing piece. There would be having that top flight guy, and hopefully either the combination of rugs. At this point, I'll just I'll start off with the combination of the two, <laughs> being being equal to like what um what a big time receiver would give you. Yeah, it's also interesting knowing that the uh, Gruden basically built the offense around Renfro and Waller last year. Most of everything they ran was was inside the numbers. Um, over the middle of the field. He didn't really run a lot of stuff deep to the, you know, outside the numbers because he probably didn't trust Ruggs or Edwards. And, and they started to incorporate more as Aguilar got up to speed. But it'll be interesting if he trusts those guys on the LSC, what, how different the offense is going to look uh, moving forward. Yeah, cool. All right, Raider fans. Um, that's I think that's a put on Raiders podcast. That was a pretty good one. I mean, if you go back and look at that one, that was, that was, that was some really good stuff. Um, got some deep knowledge. Um, and, and like, if you don't know what all that stuff is, you know, go back and this is where you learn. You go back and look. If you don't know what Ryan was talking about, or you don't know what Bobby was talking about. <laughs> go back and look and and and, um, and and find out what those terms mean um, as far as um, what, what the Raiders are doing offensively. All right. See you next time.